Sometimes they would read things they were interested in, sometimes they would read what I handed them. We do a lot of big clouds, we would talk about it. I would transcribe those and bring those back to the clouds. We really spent a long time reading about the differences in the discipline. So where I'm ending up today is because of that. Okay. So um, where should we be going? That's that's how I started out, and I hope I didn't get to the end. Okay, so we we have a problem, and the problem is is that if you look at all of the statistics, there are way 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 too many students who enter college really not prepared, and at community colleges this is. Somewhere about fifty percent. Sometimes it's as high as higher than that. And in four-year colleges, it's twenty percent. Sometimes it's higher than that. So those people who go to college, they're not really ready to to benefit from college level courses. And those were the kinds of students that I worked with at the university. Yep, they were coming to a four-year college. Um, they were not ready. And even the ones who came in, we, we started after a while. We started uh, opening up a class to students who were regularly admitted into the university and took the class as volunteers because they weren't doing so well and they really needed to because they had these plants from the state that they had to maintain a great manner. So they would take our courses. Uh, because even though they were regularly admitted into the university, they got there on their own, they were not able to do well in their courses. So um, the other big problem is that remedial coursework, like even the kind that we did, um, is largely ineffective. There's not a whole lot of positive data out there that shows you that Taking remedial courses is really very good for the students. So um, if you look at some of the statistics, four out of 10 community college students complete the courses, four out of 10 complete the remedial courses. One fourth of the community college students, one third of the four year college students go on to take college level English and math courses, which means that most of them don't. Students who skip remediation this is, this is, uh, can students who skip remediation can do just as well as students who go through remediation. And fewer than one in ten complete community college and one third complete bachelor's degrees. So that's one of the six year period of time. So that is a look at that. So, 
That's possibly because the research is still kind of buried on that, so I don't want to say yes, that's for sure true. But it does seem that there do seem to be some positive results for at least while they're taking the remedial courses, they are also involved in taking regular courses, or they're doing something like they're taking the courses that have somebody either being pushed into those courses helping them get through. And um, the other thing is uh, that it's kind of a big trend, this is a learning community trend, and it's widely popular, but it hasn't been studied a lot, and um, that the effectiveness of that. So, um, so we can say, well, if, if there's really not a lot of work at the college level that shows a clear path, doesn't seem to be. Um, then what can we? What, what about high school? I mean, really, shouldn't they be prepared? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't high school do something with these students so that by the time they get ready for college, they are actually prepared for college? Makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, so let's look at the picture. There are actually lots of programs that are trying, that are working on this particular problem right now. Um, there are these TRIO programs, which are uh, Upper Bound Talent Search and uh, Support Services. Um, and they start uh, with students in middle school, over the groups. And um, so they, they work on academic preparation, they work on some kind of social support, and they work on financial and economic literacy, those kinds of things, and they follow students through school. And uh, there's a GERA program. Anybody familiar with GERA? GERA. Okay, so it's it's a uh, seventh grade from high school. They give out college scholarships. They provide academic support and they provide information about college. Okay, so these programs are fairly popular. Uh, there are some in Chicago schools right now. Um, you probably may have students who are part of an upper bound program. Some of those have. There's a summer kind of courses before they get into college. We have that in the University of Chicago as well. We have So those upper down um, students kind of um, well, in high schools are trying to change the culture of the students that are at their schools. So what they're doing is they're making them more aware about their college choices. Um, there's also there are also dual enrollment programs. So you, I, I'm not sure about you know, you if you're part of the dual enrollment program or not, but a lot of schools are. And what happens with a dual enrollment program is that um, part of it, one of those things is, is the small school um, issue. So in high school, you're in a very small school where there's a lot of support and everybody knows everybody and they're, they try to do, they try to change the culture to make it really college preparatory, and um, they offer students dual enrollment. Now the dual enrollment can either be that they take the courses right at the high school, but they have somebody, the high school teacher, is trained by the college level students. Or they, um, by the college level teachers, or the students themselves go to the college and take courses there. So those are kind of two different models. Um, but what they can do is they can earn college credit and high school credit at the same time. Okay, so um, we do, we're thinking about having one at the USC in science instead, instead of centers. So we're moving that way. And um, there are all, also um, dual enrollment only where there's not a lot of other kinds of support there, it's not in small schools, but um, you do, they do have dual enrollment and you get free college credit, so it's a really great thing because you get to get that free college credit while you're in high school, and then you don't have to take the courses. So what, what they, um, what the thinking behind this is, is that by reducing the course load for students coming into the university because they've already taken and passed the courses, it's going to get people uh, to graduate. The people who will be done on the last year. And then there's
there's something called the default curriculum. Uh, so in schools that do the default curriculum, there's no tracking. Um, so, you know, you don't have a, a college ready class and then not uh, regular students who may or may not go to college and then most students that they're not, they don't think they're going to make it anywhere. They don't, they don't do that kind of tracking. And they make sure that all uh, students take these college preparatory classes. So, um, then there's something called EAP. And EAP is an um, early assessment program. And this, actually, I think it started in California. I'm not sure. I think it did. Um, because right now, California uh, does this in, in a kind of a big way. And what happens is when students are juniors, they get tested. And then the teachers in the school then look at the results, and then those ones who show that they're not yet college ready, then go through some intensive courses um, in their senior year to try to get them ready. So lots of initiatives. The question is, how effective are they? So um, there is some evidence that talent search, that, that's one of those um, um, trio programs, increases high school completion and college enrollment. The upper bound program from the studies that I've read has no effect on college enrollment or likelihood of college completion, except for those in the lowest groups. In other words, it does help those who are low, but if you're almost there, it doesn't seem to help very much. And gear up, no effect on overall academic performance, college readiness, or plans for college. You remember that's the one in the gear up program is the one that um, what they did was they gave, gave college by a they told you about college and did things like that. So I kind of did that. And um, the, the, the small school that's in CHS and the CHS, those are those small school initiatives. Um, there are mixed results for that. Some show some, some shows some effectiveness, others don't. And uh, overall, if you looked at the picture, it probably wouldn't be too promising either. You know, this is this is kind of a, a big deal that, that everybody's pushing this. Let's put it into smaller schools and make it a friendlier place and then we push college. But there's a lot of mixed results for that. And um, for the EAP, that's the one where you may have tested an early assessment program that tested um, as juniors and then they can make up whatever deficiencies they have as seniors. Um, they do find that there's a reduced need for culture mediation by somewhere between 4% and 6% over the And, um, but one of the things that they're concerned about with this program is that you really do need high level course work in the same year. So it depends on the kind of remediation you have. So, so far, anything look really good? It doesn't, which, you know, um, Rick came up and said, are you going to answer that question? You know, that was the title of my topic. And I said, oh, yeah, cash for sure. But, you know, there really isn't a very good answer. Not one, if you put a light on it, that there's any really good research out there that shows that it's very effective. Um, most of the studies that have been done um, have not been random science studies. Um, they have been studied, and, and you know, parallel results still. Not really a very good picture. So, you might have some ideas about why it's not working. And maybe I'd like to hear community and question it takes some time. Um, but one thing that I do suspect is that standards in high school graduation are too low. And we kind of know that um, because there is some um, uh, there are some names on the school. I don't know there's a person, I know there's a lot of them on the map. I'm not 
actually around today, and it's not that yours are the same kind of picture or not. Um, so the main reading scores for 12th grade the last time that they are uh, tested have lowered since 1992. Interesting. So um, fourth grade seems to be doing a little better. The last report was in fourth grade that remained steady from women had ranks before, but eighth, and the eighth grade had actually gone up a bit since before. So what we're seeing though at the 12th grade, and I haven't I haven't seen the last 12th grade test, so I don't know, but we do know that the picture there of the 12th grade is not And um, another, another thing might be that um, students in high school don't read. I have been in many, many, many high school classrooms and talked to a lot of high school teachers. Um, this is what I hear. Um, well, you know, the students in my class, when they came into my class, I tried to give them something to read and they couldn't do it. And so, what did I do? I can't, I have to teach that content. And so I'm going to teach it without them reading. I'm going to provide lecture. I am going to um, show videos, films. I am going to um, do some discussion. I'm going to do anything but make them read. And this is, this is especially, I mean, it's true in science classes, especially in math classes, it's very, very true. But even in history classes, you're going to find the same thing. They'll watch the video, they'll listen to a lecture, um, they will do other things, but they will not read in these classes. So, what happens if you go through a whole year, let's say, in science? And at the end of the year, you haven't really read anything. Are you going to be a better reader of science? Probably not. It's tough, though. Uh, some of the teachers that aren't even right now, they say, you know, I put something in front of them to read and they go, motivation goes right down. They don't seem to have a persistence for doing anything that's really, that, that is really very difficult or very hard, very long. And so, um, of course, you want to, you want your students to be motivated, and so taking away that reading material seems like just the right thing to do because then they're really motivated by pictures and film and other stuff like that. So, so it's a problem. The remediation efforts. This is my other is that we aim for remediation efforts in English and math, of course, but English only. So when we when students come to uh, college, what do they take? They take a math course and they take a course to beef up their English language arts skills. If they have that senior level course, what happens when that senior level course? You know they were tested in their junior year and then they go to the senior year. What is that course about? They're supposed to beef up their skills in English language arts. What do they do when they get into college? What courses do they have to take? Yes, they have to take English language arts, but what else? They have to take history, they have to take psychology, they have to take political science, they have to do all these kinds of other courses that they're not getting prepared for because what do English language arts teachers know about that content? What do they know about the, the um, quality of standards for the discipline? What do they know about the kind of reading that has to take place in terms of those classes? What do they know about the text? Because the text in these classes are very, very different. And yet, our remediation efforts are on English language arts and largely even um, on literature. Just like So that's the problem. <coughs> so, um, which is what I found out as I took those other courses. Now, um, we're coming into a new era. There's not a big backlash. The first one we were tested. And that era is the era of the Hanover State Standards. So, you all know what these are, right? Um, they do seem to be, they, if you look at them, they definitely raise the bar for reading. 
And the thing that's interesting about these standards is they're not just English language arts literacy standards. They are literacy standards for history and social studies, and there are standards for um, science and technical subjects. So right away, we're getting a recognition that it may be different in different subject areas. So that's one thing. Well, I see that as kind of positive. I do. Um, if you look at the standards themselves, they are outcome-based. They don't tell you what kind of strategies what you're going to be do doing. Um, but it does tell you what kind of complexity of text students should be reading. So that's maybe going to be a huge, huge, huge challenge for teachers when they have to start learning about the complexity of text and keep uh, up the complexity levels of the text that they're giving students because whether they did before, it took away reading, or the other thing they did was make reading really easy. So that's not going to be possible in this new era of the common core standards. The new, tougher standards require higher level thinking, and they're going to be assessed in new ways. In other words, these, the test, the, I'm not so sure about smart about but if you look at the PARC assessment, which Illinois has committed itself to the PARC assessment, um, they do seem to be um, doing you know, something a little bit different in that assessment. And um, one of the things they're doing is they are using more than one test for the questions, requiring students to go across different texts. Um, and that's something different. That will require students, um, teachers, to actually use text sets where students are thinking across the text at this higher level rather than just one text, one text, one text. Now, um, and I've done some research on that showing that students really need to be taught how to do that. But it's not something that you can just say, okay, we're going to read this text set. And what do students do? If you give them a text set, they look at each text as an individual piece. And they aren't making the connections across. What, and what they do is they take a um, back to run, how many backs they're collecting in the, the basket of backs. So they're collecting the backs. And maybe if you get backs that come across the text, they're going to be uh, paying attention because they've heard it more than once, but not because they're really thinking across text, and they don't pay much attention at all to the disparities across the text. Those they ignore. Because they're not thinking about that. What they're thinking about is that what I have to get from this text is the fact. Now, the fact is because that's what I'm going to test about. Well, things are going to change in the common core standards. So, um, also, there's going to be more extended responses than that assessment. I haven't seen the whole thing, I've just seen the practice elements, but it does seem to be a little bit different. So what I'm afraid of, anyway, <laughs> is that there's going to be a backlash. Because what's going to happen, the first time the park is given, which is supposed to be, you can start giving it in 2014, right? When that first happens, what's, what are students' scores going to look like? Oh, they're going to be in the toilet, probably. If you think about it, and if that happens, who's going to be complaining? The yeah, the teachers, the parents, the business community, everybody's going to complain about this, you know, what's wrong with these schools today, why aren't they? And so I think we really have to, we really have to do something so there's not that backlash. To recognize that yes, we expect our scores to be low. That's that's we need to have a really good idea of where students are so that we can then work harder to get them where they need to be. Um, but if we have a backlash, I know it happened in Texas. Now, Texas is not a common state, um, but they did raise their 
problem with standards in that state as well. And then they gave an assessment and they made it meaningful, in other words, high stakes. And now they're very worried because it's been a lot of crash. And I think they might lose all of the standards. So let's hope that can happen. Okay, so um, this led me all of these things that are happening in my project led me to let me led me in a couple different directions. Uh, one of them um, is I had the pleasure of working with several people in this room, um, Greg and Joe and Michael, on um, a project. It's an IES reading comprehension product a project called um, Project Red, and um, we are working on helping students develop their argumentation skills in um, the 6th through 12th grades and in three subject areas. So we've taken literature, we've taken history, and we've taken science, and we're trying to build interventions that actually do help students learn um, argumentation in those three um, disciplines to, to recognize it when they're reading and to actually learn. So that's one place that, that this is taking me. And um, another one is uh, I'm working with the Southern Region Education Board right now. And they've been interested in this project for a long time. The project director actually was uh, a person who uh, worked on that California project. Okay, so his idea was that they tested us to use your number and then in seniors, you, as seniors, you have to um, do a transition course. So their transition course that they came up with in California that's used widely across that state is the English language arts curriculum. So when I came in, we said, no, I don't think that's really the way to go. I think if you do that, it's going to be too narrow. It's going to just teach them how to do English language arts. It's not going to teach them anything else. With the common course state standards, being history, social studies, and science and technology, subjects, uh, let's build a transition course that um, teaches students how to read and write and those in different fields. So um, that's what we've been working on, and I'm working with a couple of other people from, um, from developmental college instruction across the country, and we're trying to develop a course, and I just want to talk a little bit about this uh, and about how we develop it and how it's taken up and where we are in terms of thinking about studying it because we haven't studied it yet, but we're thinking about studying it. Okay, so um, the course is for non-remedial high school students. In other words, it's not, it's not for the students who are two or more years below grade point average. Um, it's not for those students who aren't going to make it in college. It is for those students who are going to go to college, community college by and large, or maybe a four-year college, but when they get there, they're really going to struggle. So not the AP student or the International Baccalaureate student, it's for the student who um, just hasn't yet developed the college readiness skills that they need to have to be successful in all of their courses, not just English language arts, but all of their courses. Um, so um, we need this course because we're going to need it more than ever because of the common core standards. Because we're going to identify a whole vigorous group that's not really doing very well to be college ready um, when they start the practice. And um, it's going to um, raise the bar for the students to, to, to meet those high demands for their safety. And um, what we're trying to do is what we did in um, California is that we're trying to reduce the need for medium courses in college. The number that are at least 50% in community colleges and 20% more in important colleges. So we want to reduce that need. Um, I'm not sure that one course will do it, but it's a start. There uh, is also a math course that's being built um, to <clears throat> um, So 
we have it in three subject areas, English, history, and science. <clears throat> we align all of the coursework to the common core. Um, it's a literacy course where the focus in each unit is on the interactions of two kinds of learning, and that is learning the literacy, learning the discipline, and then learning the content. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean in learning the discipline. Remember I said if you go into the street classes, you find that everything is different? And so it's those differences we're trying to pay attention to. Um, each unit teaches the student to interact with challenging text, and it's also in line with the conquest standards. So, what are the differences? So, um, this is my definition, it may not be the only definition, it's my definition of disciplinary literacy. And that is that each discipline has its own unique practices for creating, communicating, and evaluating knowledge. These differences play out in written and spoken discourse. So there are different texts, or even the sentence structure of text in history are different than the sentence structure of text in literature or in science. What you read for is different in these different disciplines. What counts as evidence is different in these different disciplines. What claims you can make is, are different. So because of those differences, these actually, you have to teach the discipline. You have to teach what is important about the discipline. Um, so when I was working with these um, three building schools, history, mathematics, and chemistry. So we had one focus group was history, one focus group was chemistry, one was math. Um, they were really, really different. D different in culture, different in every way that you could imagine. They looked different. <laughs> they spoke differently. Everything was different about them. And, um, so, so let's just take one, one uh, difference, and that is in their beliefs about the knowledge that they're producing. So you talk to historians, and what do they say? They say, well, no, we don't think there's any truth at all. You can't read history for truth. Because look at the way that we create knowledge in the field. It's after the fact. We have to go in and collect evidence that's already been produced. You don't have an experiment. We have to collect evidence that's already been produced. Um, some of that evidence, is, we know we haven't collected all of it. There's no way to collect all of the evidence. And um, some of it is contradictory. Because one person can be looking at an event and talk about it this way, and somebody else can, can see it in a whole different way. So, how do we know? So they're not really looking for truth at all. What they are looking for is something that's plausible, given the evidence that they've collected. Is it, is it, is it a, a plausible story? And they want students, and they themselves do, to question everything. Question. Because there could be another interpretation. History is interpretation. Okay, so that's history. So you go into talk to the mathematicians. And these were, by the way, theoretical mathematicians, so I want to make that clear. Um, they weren't practical mathematicians. Um, but you say, uh, so what they were trying to do, what they tell you is, oh yeah, we were, we were trying to get truth. We were after truth. Because you can get to it if you follow a logical sequence of reasoning and you don't make any mistakes. Hard to do, yes. There's mistakes in everything, yes. So it's kind of hard to get to that truth, but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take this and we're trying to narrow it down so we get that concern, the truth. 
and it's what you do with your hands, how you reason. So that's the mathematicians, very different. When you talk about, when you talk to the chemists in there, um, somewhere in between. Because what they're doing is trying to get closer to the truth in order to get back. And they can't get there because, you know, their measurement devices change, things change over time, and they, they take a look at it, they ask different questions. But um, they do, they can set up experiments. And so they're not looking for just plausibility. They're looking for probability. They want to get down to the point where we can say, yes, in this circumstance, in this, if I have the same circumstances again, I could, with a 90% degree of certainty, say that this is going to happen again. The historians would never say that. Mathematicians wouldn't care. But they believe that's what they're doing. And that you can increase your knowledge to get closer to whatever's happening, you know, as you as you get this way. So three different disciplines, three different epistemologies. And that actually plays out in how they talk about stuff. Because scientists uh, are always uh, hedging their bets and always making sure that they are accurate. They're saying, oh well, you know, uh, about 80% um, of the time, you know, but not all the time. Uh, the historians, on the other hand, if you are reading history textbooks, what do they sound like? Funny, 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 funny. I mean, they don't, they don't even mention. It's, they don't even mention their methods and how they're trying, how they figure out what kind of story they're going to say. It is a tough story. So all that thinking, all of those claims that they're making are implied claims. They seem to students like truth. Because there's no mention of, you know, based upon this evidence, etc. They don't really do that kind of thing. It's all implied in the history textbook. Now there are some other books where they come out and they say what the sources are, but not really in the history textbook. So a student doesn't know that they're supposed to question everything because it doesn't seem like there are any questions that need to be asked. It's just telling a story. So enough about that, but what, I just wanted to make the point that there really are differences that, that we need to take into account when we teach students how to read and write. So there are some differences. Um, the, other, the other thing that we decided to do was, remember when I talked about when I was teaching in college reading courses, we would read through the strategy and teach students to take the strategy and adapt it to this discipline and adapt to this discipline. Well, um, we couldn't get away with that. So we're not strategies based, not that we don't use strategies, but we're leading with the disciplines. We're not leading the strategy. What the strategy is there for is to try to solve a problem in the right, So if it happens in what you're reading that a particular strategy would help you understand it from a historical perspective or a scientific perspective or a literature perspective, then that's a good strategy to use, but if it's not going to help you do that, it's not, not very good to take one strategy and kind of, you know, just say we're going to be in the strategy, because that's really not how it should be used. What we found students doing when um, I was teaching in college, um, the college development studies classes is they would do a couple of two things. One thing is they would take they would do, they would play, they would perform the strategy without really thinking about it. Oh yeah, I'm going to do my core knowledge. But they wouldn't really be thinking about what was there for, what was doing, so it was just a procedural display. So I'm just doing this. Oh, I'm going to do concept cards. So I'm going to finish the 
And you can tell that if you looked at it, you could tell their thinking was really there. They weren't really deeply processing the information. They were doing the strategy. Doing the strategy. The other thing that happened is when they left our remedial coursework and went into the university without our help of the remedial coursework, they stopped doing the strategy. Transfer is really hard to get in your study room. It's really hard. So, because they didn't make sense to them in the first place, because they were just doing the strategies without really thinking about what they were there for, we found that they weren't taking them up when they went out, when they went away from our hospital. You know, we could keep them there as long as we had them, but when they left, they were there. So, um, to develop these courses, we had uh, three team leaders, there, I was one of them, and then my husband Tim provided feedback on text choice readability, um, and we used this thing called the Literacy Design Collaborative to provide guidance on lesson design, but before we had to take that up because she is reviewing our stuff and thinking, why didn't you say so? Um, and um, we had these teams, and they were composed of high school and college instructors in this class. So I was working with a history team, and I had um, history college instructors and history high school instructors to develop this curriculum. That was very interesting because the high school teachers, pretty much, they were chosen because they pretty got, much got literacy and strategy instruction but they didn't understand history very well. And then we had the college instructors who knew all about his little great talks about history. Um, you know, they were really into history. They really, they really were historians, you know, and they were, but they didn't know at all about the literacy. So we had these two groups together and we were trying to, we were always trying to um, negotiate space so that both sides could be heard. Um, we were building this with him, and uh, we got to say you know, to the college professors, you know, well, you know, I, I, okay, let's just think about where the student is right now, and uh, what we could do. And we had to say to the high school uh, teachers, well, you know, let's just let's just think about let's just think about what would be um, the the historian's perspective. So that was a lot of negotiation that happened in, in all three subjects, and then we. Um, uh, uh, got state department participation. So the state departments who wanted to send us these teams to be part of these teams. We're working with a number of states right now. And uh, we had two face-to-face -face meetings in the development, but we had tons, tons, tons of webinar meetings where we talked about the curriculum. We had it in every board. We, um, we shared job box ideas. We did it as much as we could to get this together. And um, finally, the three of us, three team leaders had to put it all together into um, a course, which we did. And um, we just got through the pilot version of the course. And while we were doing the pilot, we had um, teachers, high school teachers, and each of these three subject areas teaching. The, you know, we had uh, two days of professional development. Um, they then taught this course. History teachers taught the history part, English teachers taught the English part, science teachers taught the science part. So uh, we, we, got, we, we have a way of work um, so that you have history, science, and English teachers all available for the course when you're in high school. But that was one of the things we had to work out. And uh, then the teams provided some continuous feedback. We uh, gave surveys to the students. We asked uh, the teams to write us. Um, weekly feedback, not weekly feedback, lesson feedback. Sometimes lessons were short, like they were one day, maybe. Sometimes they were three or four days, and after they finished the lesson, they would give us feedback. We also got um, webinar feedback once a week. We talked to them once a week. And while we were doing that, um, a number of states, um, a number of states then were looking at the material, and so was the chief. So, we're just getting that feedback now. And we'll have to go through the iteration of changing it. 
So, um, six units, two in each discipline. And that's to cover a whole year. Each unit covers six weeks of instruction, total 36 weeks, and that gives you some slush time for all the other stuff that goes on <coughs> during your high school year. And um, each discipline has a less difficult and a more difficult unit. So the second unit has more challenging texts, which are longer and more difficult, and the second unit has an increase in sophistication and difficulty of the grading tasks that are expected. Um, all units provide instruction in reading multiple texts and genres, and all units include vocabulary instruction, they have numerous opportunities for assessment and evaluation, and they all have final projects, including presentations, essays, and tests, sometimes more than one. And they're all lines with kind of more media and writing standards. So we did come up with that. And um, we, if we will result, it will be in a flexible kind of work. So let's say you have students who are in the junior year and they've got assessment data back and they are pretty low, and they're pretty low across the board. They might be able to take, they might take the whole year. So all six students. But you might have somebody who's pretty good at English language arts and not very good at science. They could just take the science. In other words, it's up to the states how they want to do this. You have somebody that's almost there, they could just take the, the last three years. And, um, Units are selected, um, they can take units for some um, so that. So, so we know that it would be possible, we're also talking about how to do a non-commercial um, I'm not going to, it's almost time to stop, so I'm just going to, to show you um, how these are done. We have civil rights, U.S. foreign relations, and history, and you can see that we have a lot of different reading genres, and um, in the second unit, we had actually more of a text type thing to be the hard things for students to read in history. Um, and lots of different writing genres. We did use um, some both historical views, writing strategies, and just pertinent to history. Like we've got sources of revelation, contextualization. We use some strategies that are both for us, but we use in particular. Well, I'm not against strategy instruction, academic strategy instruction, but we're not leading with that. Um, um, science unit, one in nutrition, one in DNA and biotechnology. The first one, the easier one, is for um, that what they're doing is they're writing to a public audience, and, and what they're doing is the second one is writing to a scientific audience. Same with a lot of reading genres, writing genres, and it's and then the English language arts one is uh, there's a literature work and the one that's not literature. Um, the shells, what is it here that do to our grades and um, a whole different just pretty wild. And same, you see lots of reading and writing. So where are we at this point? Um, like I said, we've done kind of versions, the big reviews, the state departments, and Chief, um, and we'll advise. And prior to working with them, um, uh, teachers is uh, the revised nice version. And we're worried. So, what are we worried about? Uh, we're, we're worried that what we've developed is something that if you don't really get disciplinary groups, you may not do this very well. And yet, uh, so we're having a big run professional development this time now. Yeah, I, I really don't. So that's one of the things we're going to be studying. Is how much time, how much professional development do you need to really get? Now these people will know their content. And they'll know something about the content they're going to read. But are they going to get it? And can they get it in a week? So that's one of the things I'm worried about. And um, I, I'm also worried about building a classroom culture because you know this is all academic. But what we're finding in our pilots is that 
our teachers uh, haven't really been used to giving a lot of reading. This requires them to give a lot of reading. And yet, it's really hard for students who haven't had a lot of reading in the past to all of a sudden be getting a lot of reading. So we've talked about building a kind of classroom culture that makes it okay to, to struggle, persist. Um, it's kind of hard to do that. Especially with somebody who, you know, maybe doesn't have no professional development. They may not be quite there as a teacher. Um, and I've had wonderful teachers, and some that I think, you know, we really need to bring along a little bit more. They're just, they're just not there yet. Um, and then, um, so, so, so there's that classroom culture issue about reading, about persistence. And all of those are like non cognitive skills that we're you know. How do we build? How do we build persistence to be able to read something that's hard? And that's really one of the questions for the current core standards. How do we get students from not liking reading, even with a, even with a really um, interesting question? Something that they're supposed to be, something that they want to look at. We found that those students are kind of at the lower end of the spectrum. Even with those kids, you can't have a lot of reading and they're going to start to shut down. Unless you can structure it some way, um, get that kind of culture going in the classroom. So that's what we're struggling with. And um, the that, I think we have an end. And I think we have some time for some questions. So.
Well, we did. We did a lot, quite a bit of direct instruction. We, we did uh, some discussions, some direct instruction on how to discuss when you had to learn. So, but uh, it's direct instruction directly grounded in uh, how a strategy is getting at something specific. Something specific that you want to get. So, so yeah, we did strategies, we did direct instruction, we had modeling, we release of responsibility, all that kind of stuff, but we're not leading with strategies.
chemistry, science, math, and getting working with the literacy practices of all its disciplines and helping them to come up with something that's reasonable so you can really learn more uh, and work with it and listen to what they say about their disciplines. So it's, uh, and maybe more and more of a partnership rather than coming in and coming out and we're not smart. I know a lot of nursing coaches doing a good job of that. Um, but, but it does have to be more of a partnership, I think, between the content teacher and the literacy coach rather than um, kind of an online push that kind of Okay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much.